need a movement. We need a movement. And therefore, I think it is necessary to think beyond our often relatively small organizations and formations. We need to think about building a mass movement in which the vast majority of people in this country say no to mass incarceration and eventually learn how to identify with prison abolition, penal abolition, and eventually revolution. And so that means, that means that sometimes we have to be willing to give up our control over what people say and what people think. Um, the greatest challenge, it seems to me, is to encourage people to think. Encourage people to think. And I'm actually less concerned about what they think than I am about how they think and how they begin to develop a critical um, awareness of the interconnectedness of all of the issues uh, we have uh, discussed. And I think that uh, we need a movement in which people are encouraged to, um, to respect those who are responsible for these ideas to respect all of the political prisoners who have done so much work, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Leonard Peltier, and I know I want to ask, um, I want to ask everyone in the audience to stand up who um, has been a political prisoner or a prisoner and who continues to work around these issues. movement is to encourage respect for those who have had the experience of dealing with the, 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 the worst criminal justice system in this country and the, 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 the model for what has become a global prison industrial complex. Thank you. Can I ask you for two minutes, really? Everybody? Okay. Yes, Joe. Oh. Well, I have a dream. <laughs> I've been traveling around speaking all over the country in prisons, reentry centers, high schools, universities, churches, places of worship, and everywhere I go, I see people who are eager to take action eager to build this movement, eager to help wake people up in their communities, in their circles of concern, eager to be part of this movement, and then they say, I don't know what to do. I don't want to join the NAACP. I don't have an organization to join. I don't feel like just writing my congressman. What do I do? What do I do? How can I be part of this movement? And I have a dream that within the next couple of years, we will find a way to ensure that everyone in every community, no matter where they live, has a way of becoming directly involved in this movement, no matter where they are. And I think we need to get creative. Because a lot of people, the first thing they do is try to write a grant proposal and get some funding and try to start an organization and they find out nobody wants to give you money for that. <laughs> so I think we need to get creative. We live in the age of the internet. 
We live in an age where we can form networks without a whole lot of money and infrastructure, and we have got to find a way of developing structures for channeling the enormous amount of energy, enthusiasm, and commitment that exists in communities all around this country today. And so that is my dream, that within the next couple of years, we find a way to ensure that every person, no matter where they are, can join this movement in a meaningful way, and that maybe that means that all people of conscience who care about ending mass incarceration find a way to come together in some kind of national convening and develop a platform that begins something like we, the people of these United States, in an effort to create a way more perfect union, agree to a few simple items of a platform that form some kind of loose organization that people can become part of, stay connected with, can join a movement that feels contagious and that is not in competition with other organizations in their community but helps to support the great work that is going on. We have a moment right now, a moment in our history where for the first time in 40 years, people across the political spectrum are actually open to having a conversation about our prison system and the system of mass incarceration. If we let this moment pass, if we let this moment pass without finding a way to channel this energy and allow people who are committed to get involved, I think we will find ourselves five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road saying, I wish we could build a movement, but we can right now. The energy is out there. It's just about putting our heads together and finding out a way to channel it uh, with the tools we have available to us. And there's no moment like the present, so let's get busy. Hey, I'm Veronica Kitt, and you are watching 30 Frames a Second. I'm sitting here for my host, uh, Nat Wood, who will be out with us shortly. But you just watched a conference on mass incarceration at Riverside Church probably two weeks back, two Sundays back. Powerful, powerful conference. Um, as you can see, Angela Davis, Cornell West, uh, powerful talking about issues as it relates to incarceration. Uh, some of the family members of uh, political prisoners were there. They had a phone call in from Mumia Abdul-Jamal, who called in to speak about some of the things that we need to do with regards to change. Um, hopefully, it can be a movement with that. I, I, I often like to say that a lot of reasons why we don't know what's happening within the prison systems probably is due to the fact that maybe we don't have family members who are incarcerated, or sometimes people just turn a blind eye to some of the issues that affect us, that hurt us. So I think it's important. Jam-packed audience, I, it had to be over uh, maybe 5,000 people there, I'm, maybe as an estimate. But powerful, powerful, powerful. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back with Nat, and we're going to talk about some of the, the, the latest topics that are going on with th that conference as well, um, some issues on stop and frisk, some issues on housing, some issues on uh, the, the, the vote with Obama, uh, which is coming up, and I hope you all watch the debate. And um, I want to talk with Nat and pick his brain about these uh, super PACs. So 30 frames a second. Don't touch that dial. Because if you listen close to his voice, you could hear Bessie Smith. You could hear Louis Armstrong. 
You could hear Curtis Mayfield. You could hear Nina Simone. I'm talking about a revolutionary love that allows you to take a stand and sustain your struggle in the face of whatever the world has to give you. You still have a smile and style and a deep sense of compassion. There's a militant tenderness in his voice. How many of us have the tenderness in his voice? And we've never been on death row. Why? Because there's something in his spirit, in his tradition, that allows him to sustain his revolutionary commitment for so long. But that love and that tenderness reaches out to touch us like John Cole trains a love supreme touches your soul. In a way, Sarah sings Stephen Sondheim, Send in the Clowns. We talking about spirit, y'all. We talking about culture. We talking about commitment. We talking about character. We talking about integrity. We talking about magnanimity. We talking about what it means to be great in human body in time and space for the little time you hear. Revolutionary love, militant tenderness, but also a subversive sweetness. Did you hear the sweetness in the of the male voice? Now for some of us, that's the sweetness of our grandmother's tooth. That's the sweetness of our uncles too who at their best looked at slavery and Jim Crow and Jim Crow and homophobia and patriarchy and imperialism and said, you know what? Looks like we got the chance of a snow deal in hell, but we're going to fall in anyway and reach out to anybody who's willing to fall out for something bigger than them. You can't have a movement without revolutionary love. You can't have it without militant tenderness. You can't have it without subversive sweetness and that imagination that Sister Angela was talking about. If you guys don't mind, the two of you, I'm going to go on to the reading questions and call on the two of you to answer those, OK? So. We have obviously very limited time for questions, and we really apologize for that. We'd love to hear from you all, but we also wanted to hear from them, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to pose two questions to um, Mark and to Jazz, and others can comment briefly. So, and that's how we're going to end, before Asha will take a few questions on Twitter, OK? so. One question I'm going to ask Mark as the, I believe, youngest person on the panel. Um, what is the, student, the student's place in the movement? What do you see in terms of building a student movement? Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. Fundamental question. I, I think students are the movement, to be quite frank. <laughs> I mean, you know, every, every, you know, I'm at Columbia and I see students who are organizing uh, regarding Israel-Palestine. I see folks organizing for workers' rights. I see people organizing against police brutality, white supremacy. Uh, when I was at Temple University, I, I mean, they unionized. They organized around everything from uh, stopping first to what was the exploitation of graduate student labor. I mean, everything I see uh, at the university level excites me. You know, every, everything I see with high school kids, when I look at what happened with Trayvon Martin, I mean, it was a different kind of movement. It was a different kind of resistance. But even seeing those young people offer the symbolic resistance of putting hoodies on, you know, and, and put, making that tw changing their Twitter avatar to picture on Twitter to wear a hoodie, I mean, that kind of symbolic resistance, if it gets organized and turned into something a little more concrete for me, I think that's powerful. And, and there's never been a revolution. There's never been a, a movement in this country that hasn't been animated by young people. You, right. you know what I mean? That's, right. I mean, that, that's so critical. That's right. and, and, and this movement is no different. We can't have a young anti-prison movement if young folk aren't at the center of it. And quite frankly, y'all are the primary targets of it. When you look at these civil injunctions against gangs in California, that's young folk. When you look at uh, the, the, the curfews where they make it literally illegal to be young and outside in cities like Philadelphia and Los Angeles and Chicago and Detroit, that's targeted at y'all. This stuff is about y'all. You all need to organize 
for us. I'm, I'm in the tour. I'm still claiming young status. I'm 33. We, they, we need to organize. Those of us in our 20s and close to it need to organize. Those teenagers need to organize and do this. The other thing you can never do, and this is so important, is, is you can never lose sight of the importance of these ideas. I mean, it's important to be activists. It's important to organize. But it's also important as you're in school to engage these ideas, to engage these books, to engage these thinkers, to engage these prison intellectuals. That's right, no, education is important. And that young brother right there is organizing for, uh, not at City College, but at the City University of New York to make sure that the CUNY system remains free so that young people all around the city can access quality education. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's, 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 the work, that's the work that we have to do. I, as a kid, I was organized, I was radicalized, rather, by reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, and probably even more importantly, the, 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 the autobiography of Asada Shakur. Those two texts, those two texts radically changed how I understood the world. They ch that's why I'm here doing this work. I think the same thing is true for you all. Find those ideas. Read Angela Davis. Read Michelle Alexander. Read Cornel West. Read Mumia Abu-Jamal. Their voices, their vision, their ideas will change the world. But you all have to do that. Read it, organize, and then hit the ground running. We cannot have a revolution on Facebook or Twitter. It's a good place to organize. No, I'm being real. I mean, there's something cool about Facebook and Twitter, and you will have to find a way to use that new te technology in a revolutionary fashion. It's a revolutionary form, but y'all gotta provide the revolutionary content. But once you do that, I need you all to hit the ground and actually organize in the interest of freedom and justice. And if you do that, this prison thing is, is, it will, will be nothing to change, because at every moment in history where something has changed, y'all have been at the center of it, and when we fought, we won. It's really that simple. And the last question that I'm going to ask, but before I do that, I just want to say, I love these panelists. Yeah. <laughs> I really love you all and how serious you are as activists and thinkers and participants and the amount, the quality of love that you project, speaking of love, Cornell, is very profound. And I, hats off to all of you. But I also want to ask one more question, and that's about the future and our vision, again, our vision for the future. And I'm going to ask just two people to please speak at this point. Um, and you have priority because you skipped the last round, but anybody, one other person. Which are one of the, we, people ask this a lot on all levels. What are the alternatives to prison and incarceration? Because people can't even imagine that a lot of times. So I'd like to address that briefly. Did you want to answer that? Jazz, did you want to address that? Okay, and then one other person. I belong to a group called Campaign to End New Jim Crow. You know. And I'm saying this now because I should have said it before. I want to make sure that I'm able to get home safely. Yeah. <laughs> My comrades and allies and friends out there. We started with a book study group right. in Riverside Church Prison Ministry. Right. And the book that we studied was Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And after we read that book, there was no way that we could just go back to sleep. That was a wake-up call. And since then, we put on several events here, and, uh, but after we finished the study group, the most important thing was we sat down and began to create, work on a vision and a mission statement. And out of that vision, we opted for abolition. You know, because during slavery, they wanted to reform slavery too, you know. All right, good. Uh, hopefully my audio is up. Um, you were watching some of this stuff. Um, you could take, oh, cool, that's my name. I know who I am. Um, uh, uh, we were watching uh, some of the stuff that we did at Riverside Church uh, about mass incarceration. Um, the last speaker that you saw was Jazz Hayden. Um, he uh, was just acquitted of uh, weapons charges. They found, uh, I think, uh, a pencil or something, a magic marker in his pocket, and they wanted to give him 100 years. For, Not a Q-tip? Uh, well, it might have been a Q-tip. It might have been a Q-tip. 
um, he was videotaping the uh, police during stop and frisk, and uh, for some reason they took offense to that. Um, we were gonna, I was gonna do a uh, thing with Veronica, and we were gonna talk about uh, the year's events. Um, but uh, God is great, and he sent me Coley Clark, and Coley Clark is running for uh, the United States Senate for New York. Um, she's going for Kirsten Gillibrand's seat, uh, and we just had to have her on, especially since they're having the debate tonight, and it's very political, and we have so many issues. Obviously, mass incarceration is a huge, a huge issue. And uh, we get a chance to talk politics, which is something that we want to do. So I want to thank Coley for uh, being gracious enough to sit with us and uh, Veronica for being gracious enough to move out the chair so that Coley could sit here. And uh, for me being fortunate enough to have uh, extraordinary women around to cover his butt because it needs covering so often. Uh, with that, uh, my dear, dear sister, you're running for the uh, United States Senate. Uh, you're going for Kirsten's seat, uh, Green Party. Uh, That's right, Green Party line. Uh, why? And I'm very pleased to be here. Well, I'm going because at, we're sitting and you mentioned all of these powerful issues we have. Mm -hmm. And when we look at these issues and we look at who we have in office in the Congress, I tremble. Schumer uh, helped to deregulate banks. The right. cancellation of Glass Steagall. Right. He is in office. Kirsten Gillibrand, along with Schumer, on June 23rd of this year, actually signed on to legislation against the will of the people of New York. The will of the people of New York was that, and, uh, and of more than 92%, was that foods should be labeled oh, genetically right. modified right. organisms right. in food. Right, right. Kirsten Gillibrand right. said right. no. Right. That alone is enough reason for me to be running against the sister. That All is right. a known, these two reasons alone are enough reason for me to be seeking the Senate. All right. However, however, there are bigger issues that we are faced with, and there are much more complex issues. Uh, Entergy has sent $270,000 into New York State for our politicians. Now, who is Entergy? Entergy is a nuclear energy group that runs all of the nuclear facilities in the United States of America. It is a group that has sitting less than 25 miles from New York, a wonderful little Indian Point nuclear facility <sighs> that has had leakages, that has had problems with its rods. And don't ask me how to explain these things other than that they, they are there and that they are very dangerous. And we all know that you cannot dispose of nuclear waste. Correct. We have not found a way. Correct. I don't know whether New York State knows, but you should know that uh, New York sits on an earthquake fault, that is two earthquakes. And rather than running whoop, boom like most, it runs laterally, that it just runs out and up. And if that should happen, and we have more than 5.2 on the Richter scale, we have a mass disaster for New York State. That is, more than 5.2 million will be dead in New York City of the 20 million in the region. And that has nothing to do with New Jersey, which will lose powerful numbers, nothing to do with Connecticut, which will lose powerful numbers. So of the 20 million in the region, 5.2 in New York City will be dead immediately. Of course, anything in the White Plains area, anywhere near that 25, but within that 50 miles of radius, really 100 miles, depending on which way that wind cuts off once the explosion occurs, uh, will be dead or uh, wishing we were dead. Now, you mentioned um, three very, very uh, crucial things at, that relate to all New Yorkers. That's correct. Not, not uh, specifically some of the things that uh, just refer to uh, black and brown New Yorkers, but oh, all no. New Yorkers. <laughs> Nuclear doesn't care about color. Well, and you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Schumer and deregulation, yeah. which is economics. Um, now, Congress, Congress has been, and, and again, um, when you mentioned uh, 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 genetically modified organisms in food yes. and labeling as such, he's not the only politician who was against that. Um, not only was the Congress against that, but the mayor was against that um, for some reason that uh, they've never um, told. 
And when you talk about um, uh, environmental issues, uh, such as the nuclear facility, yes. where there's also an issue with hydraulic fracturing that the governor of New York State is for. He's for um, um, hydro, uh, hydraulic fra right. uh, fracturing. I call it hydro. Uh, Make it easy. Well, hydro <laughs> fracturing. Um, um, so now you, you mentioned uh, the foods we eat, you mentioned the environment, and you mentioned the banking system itself. The, yes, the, um, just economy. those three. I mean, we have much more. And, and, and uh, not only are you trying to represent the people, but you are trying to represent the people in an obviously adversarial environment. Because both houses, and it seems almost every political entity in the country is uh, in bed with with uh, corporate business, bro. Co right, corporate yeah. business. I can't even say corporate America yeah. anymore because yeah. it's a global phenomenon. It is. Um, um, uh, and and yet, in the Senate, you'd have to deal with people who are acting. Um, against the interests of the people they represent. Um, you, talk of, you talked about uh, Glass-Steagall and deregulating the banks. That's right, yes. Uh, as we speak, they're getting rid of, uh, they're not only getting rid of, Citigroup has gotten rid of Vicar and Pandit, and they've brought in another person. Now, now Pandit was a hedge fund manager that Citigroup uh, 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 ran. Um, and uh, I think he uh, was also, uh, he also ran uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, the long and the short of it is that um, in the financial crisis of 08, Citigroup mm -hmm. was one of the most aggressive entities in terms of using other people's money to uh, lever 40, 50 to 1 uh, and uh, help facilitate uh, and and just invest everybody's money, everybody's life savings mm -hmm. in 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 suicidal. I won't even say risky investments, suicidal uh, investments, knowing that they had everybody's money and the government would be forced to come to heal and bail them out no matter That's what. That's right, including pension funds, and, right, right, which people right. had not, which the people everything, who own the pension everything, funds had not given them permission to use. Every yes. every every uh, FDIC insured dollar yes. that everyone had in the United States of America had just been lost times 40. Yes. Um, um, and our, our congressional unit, both the House and the Senate, our, our mayor, who, um, uh, who was very much involved in the real estate debacle of New York that mm -hmm. uh, has made it so that no uh, working individual can even live in New York City Correct. anymore. Um, was all in bed with this, this sort of thing. Now, this is the environment that you'd be going in as a senator. Yes, um, as a warrior. Well, it would have to be a warrior. Uh, have you given thought, uh, any thought as to how to navigate right in the center? Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean... You put it on the line, you, that. You know, <laughs> Let's I put mean, it on the line. Uh, I won't be down there exactly alone because there's more than 70 congressmen and, and senators combined who have come together around the question of uh, repealing the legislation that destroyed Glass-Steagall, right. which was the regulation of the banks. More than 70 are there. They're also looking at other issues. So there is, uh, with in the Congress itself, a new rumbling. I'm not going to pretend to, to know whether or not these men and women right. have put right. any bucks in their pockets from big business or not. I can tell you that as a Green Party representative, right. I can't take it. Right. We are not allowed to deal Right. At all. But I can't even take it. I'm running for office. I'm poor. You have to um, um, put bucks in their pocket. Just the ability to manipulate markets based upon the power they have. I mean, uh, Mayor Mike Bloomberg, uh, just because he was able to manipulate the real estate market in New York, uh, uh, gained upwards of $14 billion, you know. But that's money for um, his pocket. Right, right, That right, is my right, point with the congressman right, and right. And, the, uh, and the congressmen yeah. all have the ability to, to do the manipulate same. markets. That's and right. that's why they're all multimillionaires. You know, the downside yeah. is that the people uh, are really, really have their backs up against the wall. You scare me, multimillionaires, all of them. All of them are multimillionaires. Ooh. Every single one of them are multimillionaires. Ooh. That's, a, that's disgraceful. 
especially in a nation that we, where we talk about a political democracy. Mm -hmm. We talk about one man and not one woman, one vote. Mm -hmm. We talk about people making decisions. We said, what? We the people. Mm -hmm. Do we really mean that? No. Because if we mean <laughs> that, we need to be representative of the people. And I will be one of the poor people coming to the office. And folks, if y'all see me collecting all those dollars, don't waste any time. Come down there, grab me, and string me up, and bring me on back to New York, put me in a box. Because that is just unrighteous. That's one. And number two, Schumer certainly has um, been in bed with his comrades, because Schumer is corporate. Right, right. He is corporate. He's corporate. He is corporate he's America, right, unlike right, the right. average right. senator and I don't, and I don't or think congressperson. He's ashamed yes. of that. I think he, uh, he's, he wears that badge proudly. Well, I think he and the brother who was in the real estate market locally, who Trump, who Correct. Pats himself Correct. on the chest and goes off to Scotland to destroy sand dunes and, and right. says, I, right. I, want to, I don't like the way right. that looks. Right. 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 I mean, that kind of arrogance is alone is, is frightening. Mm -hmm. But when that arrogance is coming from the mayor of a town, a governor, right. then right. we are in trouble as right. a people because we have not understood. The young people who scream, all the young occupied people and I'm very proud of them. Oh yeah. And yeah. they scream, you know, ninety nine to one, have not understood what they really have said. Well, Just imagine they said you you own the block. Or at least who they're saying it to. But let's listen. You own the yeah. block. Right. And yeah. ninety nine of you, a hundred of you live on the block. Right. And one of them has garbage in the backyard, garbage in the front yard. One of them decides that he will make a cesspool. Right. What will the other ninety nine do? Right, right. And the true or truth of the matter right. is the other 99, like, uh, like 99 children right. in a classroom, um, I was well, certainly not a classroom, right. out on the yard or the schoolyard, would make sure the bully did what? Right. Got his bags and got them moving. Right, right. When will the American people own we the people? See, I we have that decision to make. It's not for us. I, I think that the, the American people are so bamboozled, so programmed that they don't understand what it is that's happening. They have been, uh, they are so used to double talk that they know no other talk to listen to. Um, that they are, are literally uh, grasping it at, at, you know, at shadows, not even straws, at shadows. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you made a couple of points. You spoke about um, um, voting. Uh, one of the problems that, that, as I see it, you face is the fact that you probably had a better chance in the heart of Jim Crow than you have now because Jim Crow is so stealth and so overwhelming. There is no two sides of it. It's just the illusion of not being in Jim Crow. Maybe Jim Crow is like Uncle Tom. Yeah. Last time I saw Uncle Tom, he was down on the riverbank crying. And I said, what's the matter, Uncle Tom? And he said, they put me out of my house. Right, right. So I think Jim Crow is in that same position. This new age we've got right. with these politicians in an age when we have created species lethal weapons, right. in an age where America proudly declares itself an empire. That would not have happened in the yeah, age of Jim Crow. Yeah, it yeah, just would not have happened because yeah. we still had some dignity, some moral and ethical standards, even though we were there we would never have announced it. But right. now we say, I got a drone, all size drones. Now you, 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 know? you, um, um, you mentioned drones and, and one, of, one of the issues that's gonna crop up tonight is the issue of Benghazi. Yes. Um, um, and uh, uh, the, the killing of the, uh, the uh, diplomat, Chris, uh, I forget his last name. Um, you were one of the first, one of the first people, and they like poo pooed you. I know, cause I, I was one of the first people who mm -hmm. uh, uh, said over and over again that this is not well thought out. Uh, hunting down um, um, uh, Gaddafi, mm -hmm. murdering Gaddafi, and 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 giving the reins over to Benghazi is a strategy that's gonna come back and, and bite you on the butt. Uh, just like I thought that uh, uh, 
taking sides with, with Egypt was not well thought out because they never addressed the actual issues mm -hmm. that Egypt was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And they never came to grips with the fact that Mubarak was not really in charge of Egypt, that the military has been in charge of Egypt since the days of Anwar Sadat. And both of these things sooner or later would come back to, to haunt even uh, those uh, imperialistic factions of the United States of America, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, be catastrophic to Africa. Um, you're going to be dealing with, and how do you deal with this intractable uh, force that is so adept at programming the American citizen into believing that, um, you know, sugar is something else. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not Cuba sugar. It's, it's too sweet for our taste buds. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that we have to be very clear. I'm running on a freedom agenda. Mm. It is my job to help build a groundswell, in, win or lose, mm -hmm. among the people where they begin to understand what the issues are, why they are, the history of those issues, and how we can possibly force these issues onto the agenda. In other words, mm -hmm. the people must seize the agenda, agenda for the 21st century. Whether it's around the right to vote, whether it's around mm -hmm. universal education, whether it's around health care, these are old issues. These are not new issues. They've been out here, and some of the solutions have been out here. You know, I'm running with an economic bill of rights. Mm -hmm. That is not my thinking. Actually, that thinking was occurring 67 years ago as I was pouncing into the world. Frank, uh, Franklin tell Delano me a couple, Roosevelt. Yeah, tell me a of, uh, Franklin specifics. Delano Roosevelt in 1944 sent to the United States Congress mm -hmm. an economic bill of rights that would have given every American the right to health care, mm -hmm. full health care. Every American the right to a universal education, that is education from daycare through at least four years of college. Every American, the right to a decent wage, that is employment that would provide a living wage. Now this was 1944, of course he was dead when, within probably six months of submitting that to the Congress. But my point is, is that the thinking is not new. Right. What is new is that it was there and that it's under such a pile of rubble and paper in the Congress that we've got to pull it out, polish it up, bring it to today's standards, and say that we must push it through. What is new is that we, the American people, even I, mm -hmm. just learned of that in the mm -hmm. last year, mm -hmm. doing my research, mm -hmm. that some of the stuff mm -hmm. we are fighting for has already been on the table. Mm -hmm. So this is not FDR's New Deal, mm -hmm. which did not include black people. Mm -hmm. He was very clear mm -hmm. his New Deal was not inclusive of, in quotes, Negroes. Right, right, right. This legislation we're talking about now is a legislation that came following the New Deal. Right, right, right. The 40s legislation, his last legislation. Right, right. An economic bill of rights. Right. And every American needs to assess it immediately, need to be, first of all, told it's there, to assess it, and then figure out how do we fund it. And that is the problem that, you, that I will have in the Congress. They'll let, me, they'll let me get on the floor because, I mean, that is just a part of the diplomat protocol right, of right, the Senate. Right, right, but the right, question becomes, right. how do you fund education? How do you fund health care? How do you fund child care? How do you fund uh, a major mass employment program that puts America, one, to work, two, that helps America create businesses, small businesses, all across the zone so that we won't see uh, Rochester, Syracuse and Poughkeepsie all standing in the doorway of bankruptcy, pleading with, with, with our present governor, Como, give us some funds, please. We won't see that. Because when we began to talk about equity in taxes, you and I pay individual income tax mm -hmm. unless we own businesses. Correct. We pay both. Correct. So in if we look at businesses, they don't pay an individual income tax. Correct. So businesses must pay individual income tax. Now, we will scale that. In other words, a tier level, just like we do. We're talking about 39.8%. Businesses must, those big businesses, ExxonMobil, Shell, 
those businesses that don't pay taxes at all, or have not paid taxes at all, because not only do businesses not pay income tax, mm -hmm. businesses also get tremendous incentives from the government through correct, our tax dollars. Correct, correct. So what I am saying, we have a tier level system for businesses. Barbers and shops and beauty parlors, they don't make much money, so it's no sense in us trying to pretend they do and right. forcing on them an extra added burden. So if you're making 100000 to 450000 beyond Obama's 250000 because in the present crisis, people who are making 450000 are suffering too. We don't want to push them back down into the poor class since we live well, in the class I think, structure. I think Obama was talking about personal income. Now, that's my whole point. Right, I want you to right, listen to me. Right, right. And I'm saying now we're going to talk about businesses right, and right, scale it in the right, same way. Right. Because um, um, I thought it was interesting um, that uh, Mitt Romney made this, made this big speech about the 47% who paid no income tax. That's right. But in point of fact, he pays no income tax. He pays capital gains tax. Capital gains tax is a flat 15% That's minus right. whatever deductions you could take. And not only did he pay absolutely no income tax on, on, on a net profit of in excess of $20 million a year based upon yes. his principal, yes. but he also hid a lot of that, well, hid is uh, probably not a good word, but he um, was able to use the tax right, regulations right, to in, be able to work to his advantage. Yes. Right, 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 right. As we all do when we um, fill out um, the tax. Um, and, and while he spoke of 47% uh, of the people not paying any income tax, probably the vast majority of the people in that room paid no income tax. So uh, when you talk about the phenomena, when you talk about uh, uh, when when um, the ex CEO of uh, of uh, 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 General Electric uh, made the big announcement that Obama was fudging the numbers, you know <laughs> that he had the capacity to fudge the numbers, and if somebody was going to fudge the numbers, they should really come up with better than seven point eight. Um, um, I thought that was interesting because. Uh, 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 General Electric has has not paid any income taxes, <laughs> so uh, you know, and and uh, and they took half of that plan out of Schenectady. I mean, you know, the whole moving it overseas and other places. You know. So what I'm saying, though, if we're talking about an income tax for businesses, right, 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 that equalizes things. Right, right, that means right, if you are make if right, you brought in ten billion dollars right, last year, right, we want thirty nine point eight percent right, of your income. Right. We will have in excess of $100 trillion coming to us. I don't think they think of small business as the way most people think of small businesses. When they, I think when they think of small businesses, they thinking about like, uh, you know, um, a company that employs... Uh, Thirty or forty thousand people. Not, I mean, truly, truly, you know. Yeah. They, they never give you the math of what they're talking about. They just give you this the like, game. This game. Mm -hmm. You know. They talk about affordable housing, but they never tell you what that actually means in mm -hmm. terms of how much money are we talking about. They just use this word, affordable housing. Yeah, that's disguised. You know? So you think that poor people will Correct. be able to move into Correct. that housing? In New York City is very Correct. good at that. Thank e you, Bloomberg. At that. Yeah, excellent, excellent at that. that. But what I'm saying is, if we we force an equity in tax, in mm -hmm. the tax system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Individuals pay, businesses pay, income tax. Mm -hmm. Then we will bring in enough money across the first five years alone, not only to clear our national debt, but to underwrite education, to, to underwrite a uh, mass workforce, right. and looking at the development of infrastructures across the country, looking at the development um, of eco-friendly energy systems, uh, looking at the cleanup of the other mess we got with the non-eco-friendly right. <laughs> system with these environmental right. dangerous right. systems. Right. But also, we can look at health care. We ah, could look at these cold. critical areas of child care, cold. all the areas of child care. Uh, we, 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 we'd be looking at rebuilding America, giving America a new impetus, impetus, a new energy, and creating an education system that makes sense. How a curriculum get... that is designed so that every child in the United States, whether they're immigrant or not, leaves high school oh, knowing God, how to feed, yeah. clothe, and house themselves. We don't now. We're consumers. And that is the danger we're in, and that's why they can use us so. I can tell you anything when I'm holding your bread basket. How do we, how do we get American, the, the American people? Because um, 
the corporations, the political system, uh, are not incentivized to change anything they do. They're becoming more and more effective at doing what they do and, and certainly more uh, successful economically. But how do we get uh, the masses of people to begin to act in their own best interest? Uh, uh, one of the differences that, uh, one of the most pronounced differences that we face today as opposed to the 60s or even in the mm -hmm. days of Franklin Delano Roosevelt yes. was that um, um, the, the American people acted in their own best interest. You could not convince the American people to be against their own uh, uh, health care system, being able to, to access health care just by using some strange little word like communism. You could not get the... <laughs> but they did. But they do. <laughs> they did um, it then, too. <laughs> uh, they, um, uh, yeah, but the American people, by and large, didn't go for it the way they go no, for it now. No, black folks certainly uh, did not. Um, but even black folks have been bamboozled. But now we're bamboozled too. I mean, even the immigrants who come in are bamboozled. I don't black understand. Black folks are, are, are sitting uh, stupefied as, as they are enacting poll taxes and wiping black folks off the voting mm -hmm. rolls mm -hmm. by the hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, the millions. Millions, 5.2 millions. By the millions. Mm -hmm. And and we are just as blasé about it as anything. And and our, uh, the whole education system, we are not active in our education system. We are not fighting for jobs. All they have to do is tell us that 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 uh, America is against socialism, and we act uh, uh, against our own interests in terms of trying uh, trying to make sure that we are all employed, that we are all educated, we have, all have access to health care. They are actually enabled to do what they do because we have been so programmed into inaction. Um, um, how do we inspire Let's, let's go back people. there. We have some advantages now we didn't have. That's why I say they pull it on the American people. Socialism is dangerous for you. They can do right, that in right, 45. Right, right. 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 When we will be begin, we began to develop. Right. Still don't. Right. Uh, right. When they were beginning to develop the Cold War, when they bombed Japan after we had already moved in and begun the signing of the treaty, they bombed Japan. So all of this stuff was happening, and all of this was new. I mean, you remember we were in a time period when television was just emerging, radio mm -hmm. was not that old. Mm -hmm. It was also very new then. Right. And you could pull it on us. You could tell us there was a big threat emerging because there had been a big war. More than 50 million people had died in that war. Mm. Many Americans had died in that war. And so you could tell us a lot. I mean, you could program us these issues around even the development of, of Israel. Mm. All of that could be done. So you could go destroy the Palestinian people. It could be done because the war had just occurred. Right. But some things take time. We didn't understand that we were, had something called the Marshall Plan. Ah, yeah, yeah. What was the Marshall Plan? We told the American people. The Marshall Plan was to redevelop, uh, bombed out, destroyed Europe. And many of our men had seen it right. on the battlefield. A few of our women had seen it right. in the battlefield. So we could say that because we had a picture of that. That was what was in the cognitive system. So we didn't realize that the Marshall Plan had nothing to do really about developing Europe, but was not really a ploy to make sure that we developed an arm against the emerging social systems of, of, West, of Eastern Europe. That's what, I mean, the Western, what is Eastern Europe? Russia? Yeah, yeah. Why is Russia East? Yeah, anyway, Eastern Europe. So that is what we were talking about, is how we go in, run in with Britain in 45, try to move into, in, in, into Russia, and we get pushed back out. Uh, so this is what it's all about. Scream at Stalin, and every time we scream, you take another one of the Western states away. So. This is what it was about. It was not about actually coming in there to just develop infrastructure. And infrastructure we did develop, and we did a damn good job. I know. Listen to me. We developed, so we can't get single payer in the United States. We got Obamacare, uh, which uh, works against even the founding of the nation. Europeans came here because they were running from data systems. And now we say you got to buy insurance whether you got money or not, whether you got a job or not. And job is a thing, so why should I just have a job? Why am I servant to labor? So we could use that game, but we developed the finest universal what health care on the planet called socialized medicine. In an hour when we were having a red movement, moving red scare movement in the United States, we developed socialized medicine for every one of those uh, European nations. So uh, that when I was in Spain 
five years ago and was very sick and was talking with the doctors and I pulled out my insurance card and said, I have excellent health insurance. And somebody pushed it away, started, they all started laughing, six medical doctors. Said, lady, don't bring that foolishness here. We have socialized medicine. Not only did I get excellent treatment, but I also got pharmaceuticals. So what I'm saying is, is that now we are able to say to the American people, they pulled the water over our eyes and they kept it off 20 years about the internment of Japanese. We had the world pull over our eyes it's also around universal health care. So Europe has a fine health care system. Callers, um, uh, like myself, I get mesmerized with Coley. If you want to uh, chime in to something she says, just give me a call and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can put you through. Um, um, but the other thing that continue. we did, I want to be clear, to pull in the wool off, because now the American people can be educated because we are beyond that moment of such violence and catastrophes and mass genocides uh, with two groups of people, um, with the Jews and also with the, what, what, what was it, the Armenians and next door, two, two big, two big whoever, genocides. Whoever, yeah, whoever. yeah, two big anybody genocides. Anybody who got more and, and any black, anybody and, and, who got and, and, more than uh, O'Reilly's, yeah, you so, know, so, so, is, is subject to get bombed. And, and so any black, <laughs> right, any black right, or brown right, right, or right, right, homosexual. If, or, if, if more than 50% of your country <laughs> has a Mustafa or Muhammad in there, we might drop a bomb on you. Um, so, but I'm going back now to the period. Also in that period with that same Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. we gave Europe universal education right. so that every right. European, Western right. European, could go to right. school straight through college degrees, straight to PhDs, right. medical degrees. Right. And in Germany, right. we even paid you to do it. Did you hear me? Let me repeat that. In Germany, the United States of America took our tax dollars and paid the Germans to go to school through terminal degrees while telling us the Germans were so bright. Yeah. Look at how bright they are. Yeah. You damn right they're yeah. bright. Yeah. We are paying for their development. Yeah. And if we pay for the development of a literate system in this country, a system of literacy, multiple literacies, we would be bright too. And I but really don't think all in the name of red. See, I I really don't think I really don't think the the, the people of America really appreciate how uh, misled they are. How abused we were. Come right, on now, right, this right, is abuse. Because right, 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 the right. abuse is to come in and throw this red flag over right, our faces right, 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 and tell us right. it's what it's not. But, but, it was a red flag, and that's you, all it ever was. No, we, we, we think abuse is love. Sometimes, sometimes you get beat. <laughs> oh, that baby! <laughs> that, you know, that he don't beat you, he's like, you don't love me no more. I said, so <laughs> he said, he didn't hit you. Right. I was getting a divorce. So she said, you getting a divorce? I said, oh, yes. And so she said, Oh my goodness, did he beat you? And I said, no. Oh, if he didn't beat you, he didn't he love you. Believe right. me, sister, right. if he beat you, he hates you. Right. But they threw the flag over our face and they abused us. That abuse is they took our tax dollars and used it for their games for corporate America in Europe, playing games with the Soviet Union. Um, they but had now they read, but the wall is down. Right, right. That game right, is over. Right. So the American people can now begin to, through the, 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 the clarity of the moment, if we are out here campaigning not for our egos, not to become senators, but to educate the people. So it's educate, organize, agitate, educate, organize, agitate. And to people are so awakened. You, you have you have a, a human definite being. understanding of the political system as it relates to people, and yes. you have definite issues you bring to the table. No one else brings the issues that relate to the people even to the table, so that they're up for discussion, so that people have an opportunity to say, "Well, I can get with this, or I can get with that." <laughs> How do we how do we open up the system enough so that issues can be brought to the fore so that pe because what we have now is 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 the illusion uh, uh, the 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 perception the persona is more than the information itself. Um, you 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 spoke about Kirsten Gillibrand when 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 uh, when um, the governor uh, I forget his name appointed her um, as as the senator. She's a chubby little <laughs> girl. girl. She's a chubby little girl. Look like the girl next door, the housewife who just sits around. Cute little girl, yeah. And now she done going movie star. She done lost weight. It, it's all about um, the illusion. It's not about the substance. It's about the style. 
style. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and we are mesmerized by the style so much that we don't even, that they don't even feel that they have to give us any substance. Well, she's certainly not Broadway. That must be Hollywood. It's Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood is illusion. Broadway, you got to perform. Amen, brother. <laughs> no, no, Broadway, Broadway. you got to be talented. <laughs> no, Hollywood, you don't have to be talented. It's all Hollywood, over. I didn't say that. Not, not I said that. it. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all smoke and mirrors. You know, as a matter of fact, in Hollywood, talent is actually a liability. Uh, uh, you, need, you need pecs. You need muscles. You need life. Uh, um, um, we're running out of time. Um, um, tell us how we can... Uh, uh, help you get your message um, forth so that we can at least begin to bring uh, the issues that uh, you're talking about to the table and possibly uh, help you in your in your bid to become a uh, uh, United States Senator. Well, New York, I do need your help. And you can help me by going to my website, coleyclaude.org, checking out my abbreviated platform and my 13-page platform where I lay out not only what I'm about, but how I'm going to do it. You can also help me by writing to me at Coley Clark, P.O. Box 7631, New York, New York, 10150. You can help me by phoning me. I need a lot of work with the campaign. I need workers. Of course, I need handouts and flyers and a lot of other things. So give me a call at 646-657 seven two zero seven six four six six five seven seven two zero seven and for those of you who really don't know who I am who I am you can push anything on the internet with my name Coley C-O-L-I-A Clark C-L-A-R-K I'll go into any of the such engines you'll get me not only for the campaign but for my history as a person you won't get all of it but you'll get enough of it I love you, New York. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, Coley Clark is running for the uh, 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 Senate in New York uh, City. She's going against uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, and uh, you can get her by uh, Googling C-O-L-I-A. That's Coley. It's, it's spelled Coley, uh, but it's pronounced Coley. C-O-L-I-A, Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. Is that correct? No, just Clark, C-L-A-R-K. Okay, no E, no E. She, uh, <laughs> she's not hoity toity enough to have an E. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And uh, as always, uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, stay informed, stay tuned, and do not be complacent. This is a, a war of attrition, and uh, the week will get washed away. Uh, we're out. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so glad you, uh, you, uh, you made it, you know. Uh, I made it, but I didn't get a chance to call my green friends. They're going to kill me. They say, you go on there. You know, you go on Oh, I yeah. was supposed to call people to let them know I was coming. My oh, apologies. So we could have had some it's phone right. calls. It's all right. It's, it's just right. that I've been it's right. it's rush. I've got to go right. to Rochester right. tomorrow. You uh, got to call them, tomorrow. though, because you're no, so powerful. Them. And, you know. You know, it's very important. Yeah.